Hi, uh, welcome to episode five of the Playtime podcast. Um, it's 2024. Happy New Year. Um, hope you had a great holidays. Um, I hope it was joyful, spending time with your loved ones, relaxing, having a break from your regular life, and not um, stressful, tense, um, and just drinking for no reason and eating for no reason until oblivion. Um, I want to apologize for a bit in the last podcast, the first, I edit this on using the video version and there was a bit where I got annoyed with Mario for saying someone's surname and it was all a joke and I, I swore at him and if you look at the video version that's really obvious because I'm, I'm smiling and he's smiling um, and it's all part of the banter. But if you listen to the audio only version, it, it sounded a bit um, kind of like <clears throat> I got I was angry with him. So um, after after listening back to it, I bleeped out the swear words, and I've decided to bleep out the swear words anyway because um, I just think it means more people can share it and listen to it. so the podcast, which is what we ultimately want. Although I am a big a big fan of swearing and. Um, think swearing is cool so anyway if you listen to one of the early versions of the last episode and uh, um, had any sort of trauma from from that outburst I'd like to apologize and um, would be interested to know any any listeners views on the whole swearing issue <clears throat> so this is our first episode of 2024. I've got a couple of letters to read out. Um, uh, here's one. The concert with Shona Aitken was great. She's an amazing musician. That's it. That's from my mum. Thanks, mum. It's not like. Oh, wait a minute. P.S. You shouldn't have shouted at Mario. He's your friend and he can't help it. Okay, thanks, mum. So, today's. Um, episode what have we got well <coughs> we have um the end of the year review by playtime uh we've got four out of five we actually recorded it with all five of us and graham was on a bus on his phone and he was being hilarious with um emoticons but there was a problem i've got a new computer and the setup changed and i didn't clock it and so my recording system didn't record it. So we had to do it again. And uh, Graham couldn't make the second recording. So a bit of this, that that end of the year review went out as the interval interview in the last gig. And then there were, there's a, a, a full interview with Mario. And um, Mario's got a very interesting story. I mean, I've, I've known him for like 20 years, but I've always just, been joking around with him so I've never actually asked him anything about his life and then I finally did it in the interview and wow what interesting life and what interesting guy who knew um so there was a little bit of that in an interval interview earlier in the season but I'm going to put the whole thing in there I hope you enjoy it and at the end I think I'm going to play a track by the wonderful Scottish drummer and composer Corrie Dick from his latest album so there you go, that's today's episode. I hope you enjoy it. And send us in some messages and feedback and onward and upward. Here are here is the playtime end of the year review for 2023. Welcome to the interval interview end of year playtime review. Um Graham Stevens should be <laughs> we have Mara Karibe. Do you want to say something? hi hello everybody it's the end of the year it's the podcast oh. i'm having just because <laughs> Tea. sorry we have martin kershaw hey how's it going uh we are 
hopefully going to be joined by Graham Stephen. I should confess at this point that we did this yesterday and I managed to kind of cock up recording it. So we've already done this once. So it's like doing it again. Anything uh, worth doing is a good thing. Say that again. Anything worth doing twice is a good thing. In my experience, when you do something a second time, you think it's going to be sort of um, crap because you've already done it, and so therefore it's fake. But in my opinion, in my experience, it's almost always better. Really? Yeah, I, I, I disagree with this. Like, it's always better. I've been playing the blues for the last... 40 years every time I play just like gets better <laughs> would you agree with that Martin uh sure yeah every time Mario plays the blues it gets better it gets better improves for me for me I'm not saying that I play better I'm saying it gets better for me I enjoy more Jesus Christ you guys oh come on I think that's 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 actually a great attitude yeah well 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 um we should maybe create because one of the things we well the, the the entire thing we plan to do is our review of the year and our awards for the pilots of the year in various categories and i think we should in add it we already voted on this yesterday yeah so we kind of know the winners and we know what graham's voting for even if he doesn't arrive but oh, we can, well, like you know we can be fresh we can do this as it's you change your mind you can change your mind. Yeah. But, um, uh, we could add in a new category, which is most improved blues player. <laughs> <laughs> no, most. Well, I think there's only one clear winner there, isn't there? There's really? a clear winner there. The clear winner. Yeah. There's only one winner. And it's and Tom. <laughs> so, what were the categories then? Okay, here's the categories Gig of the Year guest of the year solo of the year audience member of the year and least impactful social media social media presence of the year and um, we've added in most improved blues performance of the year which has been won by mario caribe thank you thank you i really appreciate that and um i dedicate this uh award to my fellow uh mates in the playtime team also become better and better every time they play the <laughs> see yeah, see what well, i was killing yeah, them that wasn't sincere a uh, gig of the year martin oh well yes um so i um well, I, I I went for James Mackay's uh, gig that he did with us, um, and um, because uh, I'd not heard him play at all before, and uh, I, I thought it was great. I thought it was really great energy. There was a great freshness about it, and uh, I just I really enjoyed it. But I also um, looking down the list um, since since uh, we we did uh, we did it yesterday. I also noticed we did. Um, I think it was just me and Graham. Did uh, a gig with Don Patterson, um, yes, quite near the beginning, of the year. and that was that was a big one for me. Obviously, it was it was a shame you and um, um, you Tom and Mario weren't there, but I'd never never played with Don at all before, met or even met him, and um, obviously I know a bit about his his poetry, and which is amazing, but but I'd never sort of experienced uh, his music or his playing, and it was it was. It was quite magical, so that would be up there for me as well. Even though, sadly, it, it uh, didn't involve you two guys. Did he uh, did he recite any poems of his? Because no, he, he didn't. didn't. No, he, he was uh, he just uh, he was he was just uh, no. He just wanted to play play the music and uh, and uh, his his tunes are really amazing. And, uh, and he's very sort of um, I didn't know him at all as a person, but he was very just very friendly and positive and and lovely and and the music was great so I, that was a certainly a highlight for me yeah it's it's it, i love don he's great well, i've played a gig with him and and graham where uh, he read some of his poetry uh -huh. as well as um late graham read some of his poetry hmm? did graham read his poetry no don read his poetry 
Okay, so Martin's going for James McKay, Don Patterson, one and two. Mario, what are you going for? Uh, I uh, have to say that uh, I still hold on to my belief that uh, Zoe Rahman's gig with us in the past was a highlight for me because Zoe is just fantastic. She's got the, this great, fantastic, but she's not only a great player, but she's got this amazing, happy, light vibe, which is kind of every time that we play together, it's just like, it's just happy days you know no no bad no bad vibes not not in us and she totally in, in embraced the music that that we sent and you know she wanted to make the music the best she could and she played great and she's like you know i just love zoe she's great love that she's wonderful um uh, all of the gigs mentioned so far were before we started live streaming so people can't go and watch them again although that one was live streamed and I think I don't know if it's still up li online though. It was live streaming part of the Edinburgh Jazz Festival, so I think you can. Um, yeah, and if you really, really want to see it, we can arrange something. I'll just leave. Okay, um, it might be restreamed at some point. Quite, quite often, um, Jazz Scotland restream things once they've, right. you know. Okay. Um, being in a festival so, once, so there's, there's that possibility. Uh, Graham, on yesterday's program, he was on a bus at this point in the voting, and, it, and he was sending a lot of emoticons in. It's a shame he's not here because he was hilarious yeah. yesterday. He was. And, uh, Great some time. people, I think, think he's an imaginary. He's not actually doesn't exist, but he does exist, and he was hilarious. Yeah. So he gets yeah. voting for um, the Graham Stephen Martin Kershaw duo gig. Yes, they both that. As the best gig of the year. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to go for the... Um, I think there's been loads of fantastic gigs. I thought the Fergus McCready gig was really brilliant. I thought the uh, Helen McKay gig with Ewan Hasty and was brilliant. And you can see both of those. I thought the George Burke gig was brilliant. Um, yeah. Matt Carmichael. Um, Wonderful. Phil Bankoff Trio. Wonderful. The gig that I'm going to vote for, though, was the last night of the outhouse in July. And we thought the outhouse was closing forever. And we told everybody that there was the last ever gig in the outhouse. We'd been playing there for nine years. And all four of us was there. There was no guest. And it was just a beautiful night. And everybody played great. And there was a pretty full turnout. And we got a standing ovation at the end, which had never happened in, in nine years. And it was really kind of beautiful. But then there was this little bit of my mind going, oh, so you guys do standing ovations. Oh, <laughs> oh. so that's never happened before. But it's happening now. Um, but yeah, that was, and it was, it was, you know, it was dead emotion and all that. And then literally two days later, we got an email saying, oh, it's staying open for another year, so you're fine. Which kind of felt a bit, but it was a really lovely gig, and the audience were lovely. Yeah. I think we have to say that the audience that we get coming to the to the our house is just absolutely fantastic, and they they're, it's a huge part of playtime. Um, and there's these, there's these guys that come every every time, and they're just amazing, you know. So I'm yeah, voting for the last night of the outhouse in July. Okay. Yeah. Um, so great. I don't think we have a winner, I think we have a split vote. So yeah. I don't know what we do, here. but that's it's... probably the best we can do. Yeah. All right, guest of the year is the next category. Well, I, th I think, uh, I think we agreed that, that this was Zoe actually. I mean, obviously, Mario's picked that out as the best gig, but I think also we we kind of um, all four of us thought that Zoe was the, was the guest of the year, and I would still go with that for all the aforementioned reasons. Um, but I don't know, Tom, if you you there, sort of you're there. Other I'm options? I'm just trying to create a sense of tension. <laughs> oh, I don't, mm. I'm going to give Zoe a score for guest of the year.
Okay. It's, it's strong. Is that the right way around? No, it's nine. Yeah, nine. Um, yeah, okay. Is. So let's go. Let's go. Guess of the year, Zoe Raman. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Solo of the year. Now, last night we had. Do you want to tell us about last night's? There was a clear winner last night, Mario. Who was that? And it is, uh, it is indeed Mr. Kershaw, because no. because he he did. It was this fantastically energetic, incredibly intense solo that that everyone was. We were still playing, but when you usually when you play, and there is someone in the band doing a solo, and you like the solo, you go yeah. But that was like went up several levels where actually we were playing and you were soloing and we were like, what the fuck is going on here? It was it, the um, Wayne Short tribute gig. It was just unbelievable. Yeah. It was solo where you were. It was a tune before um, before the interval. And I think I've got a recording of it on my phone. You were just like unbelievably flying. It was amazing. Yeah. Unbelievable. Oh. Yeah, Ari. Yeah, I do remember it, and I, I, I remember it very vividly, and uh, feeling like, oh wow, he's he's gone off on a, like a rocket, you know. There's shit coming mm -hmm. out here. There's shit coming out here. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I'm happy to go with that. I think there's been so so many amazing solos throughout the there's year. So but, many, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, but this, this to win solo of the year, you've got to go an extra mile. I think he, I think he um, ejected his spleen during the middle of that solo. That's that's how Possibly, much you put yeah. into it. <laughs> that's the kind of thing you need to do to win solo Where, of the year. Yeah, the extra mile. Yeah. Where Absolutely. is? It? What? Where is the spleen? Now we we threw it in the bin because it was just sitting there on the floor. <laughs> Where in the body is the spleen? Oh, it's just under the <laughs> left. <laughs> it's just under the left <laughs> rib cage. Rib cage. Mm. Sort of, it's tucked under the left side of your rib cage, uh, in the same way that your liver is generally tucked under the right side of your rib cage, mm -hmm. poking out there. Um, okay, so we need to kind of crack on because time's marching on. Um, audience member of the year last night, we had a complete unanimity on this one. It, I Ivan Park yeah. won it in 2020 for yeah. being consistently brilliant online. So, who's won it this year? Well, yeah, yeah, it's um, clearly Caroline Finn. Yeah, who is? Yeah, Why is that? Why is that? Comes to every gig, and and if she doesn't make it, she tends to send a message apologizing for not having made it or having been late and stuff. And uh, yeah, she's been she's been great. Now, the reason for me to kind of offer that kind of she not only genuinely loves the music and the experience every time, but she also. Came with this. Are you crying? No, I'm not. You look like you're crying there. No, get... I'm, 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 sometimes my eyes get. I'm really tired. Okay. So. okay. No, but um, <clears throat> Caroline has this had this thing. She, she she sent this message about how the playtime gigs over time uh, since lockdown and even during lockdown worked as a healing factor, and she's an artist arts therapy arts therapist and then she knows about that stuff and uh the fact that she said look it was really great to take to be part of this and then and then she said that the being part of the of playtime made her feel more alive and 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 more uh less anxious and it was amazing to see you know that thing that we always want um the you know to do which is like to kind of reach people and and make them feel good about uh themselves and and through music and she did she did say playtime made me feel better and uh, more sociable and happier in my life and that is just just because of that it's like mission accomplished you can't yeah. just like more. and she sent some brilliant messages into the podcast as well so She's been brilliant. So we need to get a photo with her on um, tomorrow night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So final award, least impactful social media presence of the year. 
Well, I think um, I think last <laughs> last night when we talked about this, it was it was actually quite close between me and Graham. But I think really on tonight's evidence, Graham's run away with it, hasn't he? Really? Yeah, he's. I mean, he's he's. And also, he, last night he said day. he said that you know you'd already got an award, so he wanted to win this one. This meant yeah. a lot to him. Yeah, and, and I think uh, he's, he's he's really yeah he's, he's staked his claim tonight strongly. Tonight he absolutely sealed the deal. Sealed it. Yeah. I mean, it's a tragedy because he was sensational last night on the, <laughs> and I managed to 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 not record it properly. So, I've got the audio of it, but not the video. So, all right. Um, I guess I could, you know, if people, if, they, if anyone ever does a sort of deep a deep dive into this, we could provide the audio, <laughs> show them. But the problem, the thing is, most of his communication last night was through emoticons. Well, that's, that's the thing. Show. That's the visual thing. But yeah, well, I think we yeah, could right. happily and joyfully present Graham with the award, least impactful social. I think not just in not just in playtime in in all of Scottish jazz. I think we should make it. A... <laughs> I did make a contribution towards his, uh, you know, his impact, which was the 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 big news, the last big news video, which he performed very very admirably and i thought i know but then then it uh, had to be taken down so he was only online for two days and then it got taken down so all right well there we go i think that's enough for the interval interval interview i think we should say a big thank you to everybody that's uh watching and supporting playtime both live and online we need to say thank yeah. you to creative scotland for funding our thank you thank you creative scotland nonsense nonsense that we do in various departments and um thanks to you guys for being brilliant and graham and thanks tom for uh um... thanks tom awesome uh, I, at least i managed to record this one so <laughs> uh yeah well uh big love and uh lo love and music for 2024 it's gonna be fantastic forever totally. all and right what do you think about the first set tom do what what did you think about the first set oh yeah well i thought it was pretty cool yeah i enjoyed it i thought it was swinging and sure i love your a... blue solo mario yeah it like... was the one you did in february what did you <laughs> <laughs> oh it's all right with me eh? huh huh oh that's a key you wait for my cheek to cheek arrangement in the second set yeah well, we'll see who features arrangements goes to the second set. We'll see about that. Anyway, no, it's it's definitely second setter. You can put that in the first set. It'll just blow the the gig will peak too early. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, Sorry. Uh, I'm confident it will be in the second set. Nice one. All right. Bye. Bye. Now you may have noticed in that that Graham won the um, least impactful social media campaign award, and we announced this at the last gig, and it got an incredible reaction. I just want to show you. I want to play you the audio and show you the video of Graham Graham getting the least impactful social media campaign award. Uh, this is how it went. So. Um during the interval, uh, the people online were just seeing us vote on our end of the year awards for like best gig, best solo, best guest. But So if you want to find out all the winners of those awards, that I'm going to tell you two of them, right? Least impactful social media presence. Graham Stephen. <laughs> Do you want to make a speech, Graham? I don't know what to say. I'm just so grateful, thank you. Who do you dedicate this, this award to? We'll wait to see your post. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's the one he wanted, ladies and gentlemen. It's the one he wanted. And, and uh, audience member of the year is Caroline. What can we say? The first winner since 2020.
Well, you did it. Why don't you announce the best solo of the year? Best seller of the year, Martin Kershaw. Yeah. It was, uh, it was. I think it was the Wayne Shorter tribute in May, just before the interval. Nice. He uh, did. He did some. I mean, he's, he's done brilliant, millions of brilliant solos, but that was the one that stuck in the memory. It's, it wasn't wasn't recorded, so it's gone into history. It's gone into the stream of. Okay, so that was <laughs> that was a very exciting moment, and now we're going to um, continue with uh, the full interview with the wonderful, beloved Mario Caribe. We're going to talk to you because I've never done an interview with you. No, but there's probably a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, first question I've <clears throat> got for you is: You're such a wonderful bass player. You had this incredible command of the instrument how did you i mean that i i mean i know i take the, i take the piss out of you a lot but that's a british a british sign of affection and i apologize for that but um it's only because i love you but i you are an absolutely fantastic bass player you're a pleasure a joy to play with and you've got this incredible kind of command of your instrument so how did that how did that start how did you get into playing the bass um well, okay. I don't. I don't think I have an incredible command of the instrument, but I do. I do have some some degree of uh, freedom of it. Um, it's, um, the story of the bass started when I was very young. Uh, so I went. I went to a party. I think I was fourteen years old or something. And this party was like in a house, and in this house there was there was a guitar player, a drummer, and and I think. There was a singer or or a piano player. There was no bass player, and they were just jamming. And I, you know, I just sat there and I, I just sat for, for a long time, maybe an hour and a half, just watched them jamming. And I was entranced by the beauty of the communication and the amazing joy that they were having and the the amount of fun that they were having, which was just amazing. And I just went out of that party kind of with the firm decision that that's what I, I wanted some of that. So my mom so at that then, point at that point you weren't playing anything. I wasn't I wasn't playing anything. Very uh, near just a I think uh, not long after that my mom decided that she wanted me to play guitar. And uh, I actually had played recorder uh when i was younger um but that was just like because i was shit at football and uh so i had to do something in the summer camp and then as a brazilian like, is that is that difficult if you're shit at football if you're brazilian well, it's uh, it's pretty bad it's bad <laughs> in fact in fact i was actually shit at all the group sports it was terrible and um so anyway, um, I kind of my mom said, "No, you're going to start playing guitar." So I started playing guitar. I, I uh, went to have lessons with uh, a very, very nice guitar teacher that had taught her a few times, and he had a, a a little music school, which is about a long bus journey from my house. But I used to go once a week, once a week in the afternoon, and spend like a, having a lesson with him, and that's when I learned to play bossa nova guitar. And then I would have the lesson, and then he was a really, really wonderful guy, very funny. And uh, and then after our lesson, he would just go and jam, you know. But I didn't have to come home, so I would stay and and then you know talk to him. And he would he would have all sorts of instruments in his musical. So I'd play congas, I'd play drums. I kind of you know it was it was wonderful to have free access uh, to all these things, and he was just like really. He had the time and the patience to kind of take me through it. And in one of those times, I actually found an electric bass in a box. Um, I picked it up and I asked him what, what it was. He said, was this a guitar with six strings? And he said, oh, no, it's a bass guitar. And he said, actually, do you know what? I don't, I don't want this. You can take it. So I took that bass guitar home. Wow. And, um, uh, and it, in it went underneath my bed. And it stayed there for a, a few months maybe a year or something. Then I stopped having lessons with him. 
And after when you say it was under your bed, did it? You never touched it. It just lay no, there. No, I, I took it home, shoved it underneath my bed, and didn't didn't touch it again. Uh, I think it was a, about a year later. I was coming from school. My dad would pick pick me up. He didn't do that often, but I think this time he did. And I think it was seventy uh, eight. If so I'm not mistaken, and I think Heavy Weather had just been launched okay. worldwide, and it was the very first jazz album that was launched simultaneously worldwide. And we were coming back home, and then in the radio, it was playing Birdland. Okay. And then both my dad and I just like we arrived home, and then it was this whole program about the entire album. So they played uh, Havana, they played Birdland, they played <clears throat> Teen Town. And I was listening to that. I was like, "This is by Weather Report, just for the people yeah. that are watching." Yeah. Yes, that's the Weather Report. It's a fantastic album. album. Yeah. With Jacob Pistorius on the bass. Yeah. So that there and then, I just became completely entranced, and I and I was like saying, "Yeah, I gotta check this out." And then, uh, and then and I you went happened back. to have a bass under your bed. I just happened to have a bass underneath my bed, and I started kind of you know uh, noodling with it, and and. The rest is history. I started kind of that was how I got hooked into into bass. But your dad wasn't your dad a good musician? My dad was a wonderful musician. He was a composer. He was an engineer, and but he was also a composer and a pianist. He used to come home and play for hours and record. He used to improvise and record his improvisations, and then from these improvisations, he would distill some compositions. I still have the, those tapes. I have. Uh, I wish I could actually bake them and and digitalize them because they are fantastic. You know, uh, they are just like there's about ten or twelve reel to reels this size, big ones. Okay. That he so would how record. come? It, how come you were fourteen? You had a very musical dad, and you'd only played the recorder. Did he not play music with you or encourage you to play uh, younger? Well. We we I think we we didn't play when we when I was younger, but I always listened, and he always played. And uh, I think my playing really started when, well, first of all, when I was in that summer camp, and I actually had some kind of recorder lessons. I actually uh, learned to play uh, uh, Jesus Joy of Men. And play that uh, in G major. It was, you know, it's quite exciting. I performed it at the very last uh, night of the camp. Everybody loved and clapped, and they thought it was cute. Me playing Jesus Joy of Men in a little recorder with my teacher. Uh, no, but we didn't play. We we played a lot later on. Once I actually played, started playing bass, and because my dad, he really didn't kind of engage very much with us when we were kids younger kids but okay. as soon as we became adolescents he couldn't have enough of us he really uh thrived on on what most parents detest and and struggle you know he loved our uh our argumentative nature and he loved to have arguments discussions it's and because you've never seen t to me to be argumentative in any way i know i'm just such a sweet Con, you know, content, agreeable person. Very quiet, very quiet. <laughs> yeah, you too. You too, by the yes, way. I'm very similar, very similar. Yeah, it's like uh, very quiet, very content, and not opinionated at all. <laughs> and do you think that he, because um, there's a, you know, you're a parent, you've got your three boys, you have to make a decision whether you're going to really try and push them to study music and learn an instrument when they're young or whether you just leave it to them to find music themselves you know yeah i think that was pretty much what happened he never forced me and he didn't need to because one day i came from that party and came with a decision you know made and I'm, i remember that that party decision was a decision with myself that i i wanted to have that kind of fun but after starting to learn the bass, after picking up the bass and listening to Jack White, I went to this jazz music school uh, okay. uh, after school, and we would spend the afternoon there and then just play standards with everybody. 
and that was like that was uh, twice a week, and then eventually they would have like a Christmas concert. That was about sixteen. 16, 17. Sao Paulo. Then Sao Paulo. And then um, they would have like end of year concert. And I mean, usually, you know, typically there were only three bass players to kind of accompany about 60 saxophone players, guitarists, and everything. So I kind right. of was drafted into really accompany, you know, 20 dudes and dudettes with, without much, you know, knowledge. But there was this really grumpy piano teacher that really didn't like me very much, but he was very kind to me. He would take me under his wing and he's like, okay, you sit down, you do that. That's the tune. Okay. Back. And it was like, call like, I don't know, autumn leaves, autumn leaves, one, two, three. And I didn't have a scooby about what we're supposed to do. And he goes, play, walk, walk. And I was like, ah. so it was like a real baptism of fire. Uh, so after that first concert, I, I kind of got my bearings and I started having fun. And then he was like, yeah, man, you're doing good. So I started having some encouragement. And from then on, I started playing more and more and more. And then I started uh, playing games with, uh, I, I hooked up with my friends that also played and started, you know, kind of gathering. Uh, and did you go friends. to music college in, in Brazil? I eventually did. What happened was at the end of, high school right at uh you know beginning uh there's three years i have three years of high school there and uh, i think halfway through the first year of high school i decided that i was going to be a professional musician and my mom was mortified when i when i announced that very in, in not very, in no uncertain terms that i had decided i was going to be a professional musician she was like oh what did she God, want she to do well she I don't know what she wanted me to do, but I think she was very worried that I was going to be poor. <laughs> and she, she got that wrong. <laughs> well, she said, you will never have money and you will regret that. And I said, I remember, you know, from the height of my 17 years old, I said, I don't care about money. <laughs> I will get to meet, um, fat, I will get to meet fat drummers. That's more important. Oh God, the things we say when we are the last, I don't care about money. Anyway, um, and my dad was, he was taking a more philosophical approach. He said, okay, if you want to be a musician, he, he knew that he had quite a lot of influence in that decision. If not directly, indirectly. Sure. And then, and then he said, if you want to do that, at least you've got to go and do university. You've got to do a higher deg deg degree. Yeah. And then I asked my dad, "Would you will you give me an acoustic bass?" And he goes, "No, nah. uh, I gave you the electric bass. If you want the acoustic bass, you got to work and buy it for yourself." He was quite strict about that. And I was like, "Fine, okay, that's that's cool." So I <clears throat> I couldn't really work and make enough money to buy it. So I sold my electric and bought my acoustic. To which uh, then my friend said that I was ruining my career because I was going to stop gigging and also at the same time got accepted at the university, the music school and got moved into another town where I went into the classical comp composition music course. It was a six years okay. course. Um, but as soon as I got there, I started playing jazz with my piano teacher and the timpani player of the orchestra who was also a drummer. And then, you know, in like three weeks, I was gigging with all the professors, all the, the, the faculty. It was amazing. I was the so only You were on a classical there. course, but you were playing jazz with the teachers on the classical course? Yes. And were they good players? They were great players, yeah. They were teachers in a music school that was a classic music school, but they also played jazz. They were, you know, he loved Bill Evans. He played standards, improvised. Yeah. The drum, the timpani right. player in the orchestra wow. also played jazz. So he played, you know, he loved uh, Tony Williams. He was like, they were totally pulled up. And it's like professional. Wow, musician. great. And then, so, so I started kind of, you know, do, I, while I was doing my course, and I also was having lessons on, on upright bass with the, the bass teacher there that also played jazz as well. And he was very happy that I was playing jazz. Uh, and trying to teach me Capuzzi Concerto, which I 
never actually liked and never could play it. But you know, but you he, played he bow very well. Is that where you is that where you learned to play the bow? That's when I started, I, but the bow came a lot later. It's like I kind of knew the mechanics of it, but never actually never took a taste for it. It was only much much later when I started listening to Paul Chambers that okay. I actually started get more into. Oh, I want to try and see how does that work. Uh, but yeah, but. No, not at first. The bow is a is a is a different beast. Uh, it was actually when I actually uh, started playing with Greg and Marcus Bigo that I actually started really getting down more in you know how to get the sound. And Greg, as you know, can can talk for days about the nature of the instrument and the bow and the wonderful sounds and blah blah blah, which is great because I learned a lot from him. So after that, I think I actually it's looking at the ball in a different perspective and using it much more. So this is amazing. It's a beautiful story so far. Um, because we're sort of running out of time, and the, the 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 I'd like to know how you chose to come to Scotland and why you chose to come to Scotland, and finally, what playtime has meant to you being in playtime for the last nine years working with these amateur assholes every causing you all these problems it's a one you're, you're all wonderful you are you are my you're my uh soulmate no it's okay scotland scotland was um uh, coming to scotland was in 1996 i met you i think i met you a year later than that 1997 you were doing karma yeah. park Multi-story Karma Park. Uh, okay. At the launch of the Glasgow Jazz Festival, it was 1996. I decided to come because at that. Did you point, go to that gig? Uh, no, I didn't go to that gig. Yes. Or did I? I think I did. I think I did go to it was Street Market, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, if you'd went, you'd probably would remember it. But I remember that I went to all the gigs in the in the Glasgow Jazz Festival at that point. I must have. Okay, been. we were dancing and stuff yeah. on stage. Yeah, and off stage. Right, maybe I didn't go then, but I did meet you in the launch. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe you went, but you fell asleep, or you left no, after no, five I, minutes. No, I, I, I don't think I went to the gig. I remember the gig being announced. I remember you talking right. about the gig. But I don't think I went to the gig. So anyway, okay, we came because uh, we wanted to make a move and leave Sao Paulo. Deca, my wife, uh, wanted to go and live somewhere else. Uh, the quality of life in Sao Paulo was not very conducive for a small family, and so her sister, who married a Scotsman in the 1970s, uh, and had the Scottish, where we now live, gave us a suggestion. They had lived here for a few years, then went back to Brazil and stayed there. And then they said, by that time in 1995, she said, why don't you go and stay in Edinburgh? We have the cottage there. You can rent the cottage and stay there. Edinburgh is a really lovely city, et cetera, et cetera. And then I came in 95, got in touch with uh, Tommy uh, in uh, in, in, enrolled in the National Jazz Institute, which was then the course that he was leading in Strathclyde University. And I came, we came in 96, uh, we packed the bags, I left my band, I was kind of working in a band that actually was kind of working a lot at that point, and we just came. Uh, with it must have been a really elder. big decision to do that. It's a huge, huge, huge life-changing thing. It, it was a great adventure, yeah. um, which changed our lives, you know, for sure. Uh, so at that point, Tia, my eldest son, was five, and uh, he was my baby uh, boy, which was one and a half. And then in 2000, Luca was born in, in here. So we have a son that was born in Scotland. Unfortunately, he cannot be, he can't have... British citizenship because 
of immigration things. But um, yeah, so say that again. We, we can't be. Luca can't can't have British citizenship. Really, so he was born, born here. here. Yeah, Shit. It's kind of home office, home office shenanigans. Fuck those people, man. So, no, no. So anyway, um, yeah. So then, and then when I arrived, it's like I met Tommy. Tommy was like, "Let's have an audition for your course." So let's see what you can do for the course. I was going to do the course, the NJI. And then I started playing, and he goes, "Okay, let's play. Play these blues. Play these rhythm changes. Play this tune here. Play that tune there. Let's jam." And then at the end of the recording, at the end of the audition, he said, "What are you doing in October?" That was just that <laughs> tune. And he said, uh, what are you doing in October? I said, nothing. I'm hopefully coming to this course or every Saturday. It was a Saturday course. And he goes, okay, you're in my Autumn Beasts of Scotland tour. I'm going to hire you to be the bass player. I was like, what? So it was like, <laughs> I kind of flopped into like Tommy a Smith's film, A movie and, moment. A movie moment. Yeah. That was still a movie moment. I had one of those with Tommy that I I played at a jam session with him at the Glasgow Jazz Festival and it got into sort of Elvin Jones Coltrane vibe and it was kind of fun and then after the we played a few tunes and then he came up and said yeah man you want to join my band I was like oh oh yeah sure okay and it was great and it was great right up until the moment I got fired well I didn't get fired I just didn't get hired anymore <laughs> But it was a good moment. The moment of getting hired was a good moment, you know. It is. A, it's a wonderful moment. It's a very, it's a yeah. very elating moment. Um. So, yeah. And then I started. I did that tour with uh, Andy Panay, Tom Gordon, Steve Hamilton, Guy that Barker. That was a fantastic, uh, fantastic set of music. That I love. That uh, that's my favorite. Some of my favorite. Yeah, that, was, that music. was like that was amazing. That was an amazing experience. It was like. Kind of touched the ground running and just fell right in the middle of of the best musicians. We're like, whoa! So <clears throat> yeah. So after that, yeah, you know, I got steeped into the Scottish scene and um, started playing with you, started playing with your brother, started playing with John and Brian and Martin and Kevin and and everybody else. And um, so playtime, what playtime kind of started as, as as a really kind of a nice fun thing it was fun wasn't it in the beginning it was just a bit of fun that's just it's never been jazz. fun for me oh really i'm so sorry let's play the violins <laughs> here <laughs> no it, you know it, it, well it was also like about initially it was about writing new music every week and uh exactly it was a cool so idea. that was really it was a really cool idea, and after our uh, growing pains of the first year and a half, when we actually got into the you know fortnightly uh, shows that started kind of gathering some sort of follow, it kind of started getting really fun and more serious, more serious in a in a nice way, in a fun way. You know, it became a, something that we look would look forward. And then, of course, when when uh, lockdown hit. And we we had to stop. It was a uh, it was playtime. Was a, was the lifesaver. It was the only gig we would have online. And I remember that that it was the that Thursday was the day that I would just like you know wake up and thinking about what why we're going to do, how is it going to be, and the whole day would actually be dedicated to this anticipation of being online and playing. And it was an amazing thing that that kind of you know. Now, ten years, ten years later, now becomes this kind of uh, thing that is even it goes beyond ourselves, doesn't it? It's beyond you, Mark and Graham, and me. It's like it's kind of a yeah. thing. It has guests and has people coming in. Well, I think the audience. Are, I think the audience are, are, are a huge part of it, and. Um... Because they've kind of grown with us, we've kind of all grown together, exploring new things, and and we've been on a bit of a journey. So that's 
that's been amazing. I, I haven't experienced anything like that. And and the uh, the whole COVID thing was such a big curveball, but we you know we came out of it, and now we're back in the same venue. But it's just great. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Anyway, I think we're kind of out of time. So um, <laughs> that's a brilliant story, man. I never knew you were so interesting. That's because you never bothered to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I should shut up more and let you do more talking. Maybe you should ask more. <laughs> Listen more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and tell me less jokes about foreigners. Or use me less as, as joke bait as foreigners. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're not. I know you're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. Thank you so much for uh, for doing this because it's been really amazing to hear your story and um, uh, it makes me love you just a tiny little bit more because I already loved you, you so much. There was only a little bit I more I you. could love you, but I already. I, I love you uh, this this much. All right, man. Well, listen, I love you. Thank you so much. And um, onwards, keep the the playtime journey going. Let's keep it going. Let's do that. Let's do that. All right. Lots of love. So, um, <clears throat> thanks for that, Mario. Um, what a brilliant story that is. And what, how lucky are we in Scotland to have Mario to have chosen to come here of all places to go. Um, so I'm going to finish off this episode with um, one of the things we want to do with Playtime Podcast is just draw attention to the diaspora of Scottish jazz musicians. Some live in Scotland, some outside Scotland. And... I'm particularly interested in this next composer drummer because I'm a composer drummer and I think composer drummers are interesting people because we tend to write music that's a bit different to, let's say, saxophone players and piano players. Um, and uh, this next piece is by Cory Dick, who's based... He's been in London for a long time. I think he's moved out of London. He's got a couple of young kids now. Um, his first album was absolutely stunning. Uh, the writing on it, the composing on it. He's a really, really wonderful drummer as well, but his composing is really superb. And um, a mixture of so many different styles and influences and vocals and lyrics. And there's a little bit of Ghanaian drumming in there. <clears throat> um, so this is his second or third album that's just come out. It's called Sun Swells. And I went to see I want to see them play at the Traverse in Edinburgh, and it's not the same. It wasn't the same band as on as on the album that I saw, which was Rachel Lightbody and Tom Gibbs and Norman Wilmore. But it was really fantastic, and I love the compositions. Um, so I got the album that that gig, and this is a beautiful tune, a beautiful song off the album called Golden Flowers, and you can get it. Uh, Bandcamp and iTunes and places like that and this track is called Golden Flowers I hope you enjoy it see you next time thanks for listening or watching this is a bronze and a burnished beauty that belies what's beneath This is love in reflection That has only worth when withheld She is a sad and a distant echo Only mirroring sound When he calls she must answer He has only love for 
for himself she is That has all 